back and ready to go for episode number 46 of the Shutdown Inning Podcast. I'm Steven Risotto. Alongside me, as always, is the great, the legendary Tyler Hall. Tyler, what's going on? Hey, hey, everybody. Yeah, doing doing pretty good over here, but but we got to talk. Some uh, some major developments have happened. We've talked about them, but we're, we're, we now have two college graduates oh. on, on the Shutdown Inning. Congratulations, dude. Thank you. I was one. I completely forgot. I was wondering where you were going with that. Well, I appreciate it. Uh, for those that don't know, I graduated uh, over the weekend. Had two graduations. One of them, uh, the whole SF State graduation at Oracle Park, where there was thousands of people graduating, and it was four hours long in the misty fog. Um, that was a San Francisco type of day. And then the next day, we had the journalism department graduation, which was about probably thirty of us um, that graduated. So. I am a recent college grad. Um, I appreciate the shout out, Tyler. And uh, it is, it's really cool. I, I got to figure out what to do next with my life, yeah. but it's really yeah, cool. Yeah, you're, uh, you're a real boy now. You got to figure out what you're going to do with yourself. You're a real boy. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> what Pinocchio has always wanted to be, I am now a real boy. Yeah. Congratulations, dude. Thank you. I'm looking forward to it. And and I will say, this is not something that we had on the list but we should tell our our listeners and our viewers that we saw each other since the last time we recorded. We did. I was thinking about that too. Actually, I got the uh, got the official banana ball right here on there the desk. Is. Look at that. Uh, yeah, we got to see the bananas for the, the second time. We saw them last year. We saw them this year. The whole we got to see a whole game this time. No light outage in uh, in Sacramento this year. Um, it was really cool, man. I, I had a blast. It was it was a blast, total blast, and I'm glad that you mentioned like we got to see the full game. Uh, I think we did an entire episode on our experience last year, and we talked about how the lights went out in Sacramento. That wasn't the case this time around. They did play a full game against the Party Animals, and we saw a walk off. We almost saw the tiebreaker, which is disappointing. We we didn't see it, <laughs> but we saw like a walk off. But like, I, I know like there's walk offs every inning sometimes, but this was like a legit walk off to break an actual tie. So, um, and we saw a few friends of the show. Yeah, we got to, uh, got to see Stilts again, Dakota Albritton, uh, no bullpen this time, but, uh, g- always good to see him. Yeah. Uh, what other friend Bryce, of the show did we, we saw? Oh Bryce, yeah. Well, Bryce is a friend of the show. He's never been on, but yeah. Uh, Bryce went with us last year <laughs> from Twitter and Bryce, I know is listening. Hi Bryce. <laughs> and, uh, and Brian, Snot Rocket yes. 40. So. Snot Rocket 40 is always a legend and yeah. good time with him too. So, yeah. And we got to, I got, we got to meet Jesse cool, Cole, which was really cool. Uh, the owner and, and founder of the bananas really, uh, and yeah. his wife, they, they did it to, together. You got to sing with them. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> stand by me. He helped correct me on a couple lines, but he was, he was really cool. Uh, now it's so, in yeah, the video. Was... I don't know if you're ever going to get around to posting the video, but you screwing up is in the video that I took. Oh, good. Yeah, there's also a part where one of the guys on the bananas like does a back or a front flip over a garbage can uh, that was out in front of the ballpark, and I asked Jesse, I was like, "Oh, are you next? Are you doing that?" And he like laughed and was like, "No." <laughs> so, uh, so yeah, that was cool, man. Um, yeah, so always good to see you, my friend. And, and the bananas are always a good time. So hopefully, I'm sure they'll play somewhere in Northern California next year. Maybe Oracle. We'll see. Uh, yeah. But we'll just have to make this the annual tradition, man. Yeah, Shut no down knock. inning at Banana Ball. Shut down inning at Banana Ball. No knock on Fresno, but like the stop before Sacramento, like we know where it should be <laughs> <laughs> at the corner of Third and King. Yeah. but Or just do a whole series there for all of Northern California. They played three games in Sacramento, so they could do three in Oracle and probably sell out the thing every time. They so. would sell out the Coliseum. I'm sure of it. Yeah. So, I mean... Well, while it's still there. We'll While see. it's still there. Yeah. Final few months remaining for, for the, oh, I guess it's it's only late May. The, the building will still be there for a while, I'm sure. But. Yeah. Hopefully that building's put to good use. Um, Anyhow, speaking of good use, let's put ourselves to good use. That's not a good segue. I got to work on that. Um, oh, for one in the post. That's what you can degree. work on. Yeah, yeah. You said you needed something to keep you busy. Work on your transitions, man. You have some good ones. You have some good yeah. ones. Yeah, and usually they just c- come to me and I, I let let it fly. So yeah, just just work on some transitions, man. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, um, speaking of letting it fly, uh, Luis Arias, no, 
still not good. <laughs> Luis Arias, uh, since we last recorded, we'll hit on this real quick. Um, the known for contact hitting Luis Arias from the Marlins was traded to the San Diego Padres. And if you're wondering what this means, it means that the Marlins turned in um, their, you know, they put up the red flag and they called it a season. And basically their front office said that too. I believe their general manager uh, said publicly that we're not making the playoffs and that's why we did this. Um, Kind of interesting to say it that blatantly, but I mean, I could have told you that you could have told us that, but Mm -hmm. Arias is now a Padre. Yeah. I mean, I think the timing of it, you don't really see, a guy uh, like Arise getting traded this early in the season. I guess, you know, they figured if if they, even if they believed and then mentioned publicly that they're not going to make the playoffs, you know, you get more in return the earlier you, you make those deals. So it's just nuts to me how the Padres always seem to have the prospects to to make these trades. It's pretty ridiculous. And ended up being a good, uh, good investment for the Padres with Xander Bogarts now being on the shelf. So now they'll, I think they're using Arise as the DH mostly now they'll they've been using him at second while uh bogarts comes back i know they're expecting him back at some point this year um but pretty nice to have one all-star caliber player go down and you can just slide another one right into the the lineup in that same spot yeah no that's a good point bogarts went down with the shoulder injury and he's going to be out for a while and uh it, it reminded me of that one play and this is gonna you know we have giants listeners you might remember this remember when freddie sanchez hurt himself diving up the middle and like dislocated his shoulder. It kind of reminded me of that, but um, yeah. enough with the shoulder injuries. Cause Jung Hu Lee also has a shoulder injury that he's going to be out for the year for that. We didn't mention, but uh, I, I found the exact quote from the, uh, the GM or it's the president of baseball operations. His name is Peter Bendix. And he said, uh, quote, we are unlikely to make the playoffs this year. Um, it was an incredibly difficult decision. Uh, he's talking about trading Arias. He's not just a great player, but he's a phenomenal person, a phenomenal leader. Ultimately, it felt like this was the right decision for the Marlins organization to help get us the place we need to be. Um, the Marlins get Dylan Head, uh, Jacob Marcy, uh, Go, uh, Wu Su Go, uh, I don't know if I'm saying that correctly, and Nathan Martirella. Um, so an interesting deal, five-player deal. Um, and Arias has torn it up since he's been in San Diego. So kind of a shot in the arm for them. Yeah. I mean, they're, uh, they, th- along with the rest of the NL West outside of LA, they started off a little slow. Now, uh, I think them and the giants are in a wild card spot if the season was 60 games long. So, yeah, I have a feeling that last national league spot is just going to be like, it's not going to be a great team. I think we knew that going in, but, um, it's going to be a team that could, you know, sneak in and be dangerous. Like I think the Padres in a postseason series, it's not no matter if they go like, you know, if they have like 83 wins, they're still dangerous. I think just because the pieces they have and um, you, you don't want to navigate through that lineup in October, no matter how many games they won in the regular season. I mean, the giants have shown it in all three of their runs uh, and, you know, other teams have as well. All you need is a, a, a ticket to the playoffs and then anything can happen. So doesn't really matter what your record is, but yeah, I agree. The the Padres, especially with their lineup, could be uh, be scary to run into in in October. Absolutely, and and from San Diego, we make the cross country trip to Pittsburgh. Uh, another development that happened is we saw Paul Skeens. Paul Skeens is here. We've been waiting for this since he like probably got drafted. Uh, and we always talk last about year. how <laughs> yeah, last year got drafted. We always talk about how guys get drafted and like. We don't see them for another three, four, or like two, three years, right? Um, but I think it's starting to like be minimal. I, the The waiting time in the minor leagues, the development process is starting to become minimal. These guys are just so dominant in the minor leagues now. I think more so for pitchers than position players. And teams are so like not willing to waste their bullets in the minor leagues that like, hey, come on right up. You're going to be promoted. So it's a little different yeah. for position players, but... Very fast rise for Paul Skeens. Yeah, he's actually throwing right now. Uh, Pirates are up 3-1 against Detroit. So it's second game of a doubleheader. Skeens has struck out four through two innings and given up a run. I mean, he had that one start against the Cubs where he went, was it five or six hitless innings? Um, he's He's been dominant, uh, you know, 2.5 ERA right now. 
you know, it's, it's cool to see some of these young guys get, get drafted and just move right on up. Oh yeah. I saw this headline earlier too. And I just pulled him up on baseball reference today says 22nd birthday. So in the majors before he, you know, when he's 21, um, you know, it's good to you see know you know, teams. You not, know what that means? He's older than you. He's older than me. I know he's, <laughs> I'm older than him. Wait, you're 22. I already turned 22. I feel April. like you're always 21, yeah, dude. That's true. Yeah. He's yeah. younger than you. Yeah. By, a, by a few weeks, but, um, yeah, I mean, he's been fun to watch. Luckily, the the he didn't take the loss, but the Giants won a game that he started against the Giants. But it was fun to kind of see that, uh, you know, to see him in a game. And, uh, you know, hopefully he's, you know, hope it for everybody, but hopefully he can stay healthy. And, you know, 22 years old, he could pitch for who knows how much, how long if he stays healthy. So hopefully the start of a, of a bright career for Paul Skeens. Absolutely. And he's probably going to have some kind of innings limit on him. Um, you know, I, I wouldn't be surprised if we see, especially if the pirates aren't in, in it, uh, towards the end, we probably see him not pitch a lot in September. Um, but you know, just a really like electric stuff and he's not going deep in the games yet. I don't know if anybody expected him to go deep in the games yet, but, uh, or if he's ever going to be that guy, because he does kind of leave it all out there for the first few innings and, uh, entering into the game today, he had a 21 to like four strikeout to walk ratio uh, in 16 innings, which is pretty impressive. And um, it, it it like his debut is kind of like must see TV the way Steven Strasburg's debut was. Um, I remember Garrett Cole's debut being that way too uh, when he made his debut against the Giants. Uh, I remember yeah. he, um, I think he hit Gregor Blanco. I don't know. Something happened with Gregor Blanco in that game. I can't. How remember. dare he? No one throws at Gregor Blanco. Yeah, what the hell? Um, but yeah, Skeens is going to be good. He's he's the hardest thrower among uh, starters in baseball right now. Um, I think he threw 100 pitches. I don't know if it was his debut or... I think it was that Cubs game. The Cubs he, game. That's why they pulled him. He was hitless, but he'd already gone up to about 100. And I, I think his last pitch was triple digits. Wow. Okay. So Which is just well, that, wild. That's insane. So he's a specimen. And that's like, I think we talked about Mason Miller a few episodes ago with the with the A's. He's throwing hard. I think he's averaging around 100 miles an hour. And just doing that as a starter, like, I know it might not be sustainable over the course of a year, but, you know, he's he's getting up there. He's putting, you know, there's always the stat cast thing. Remember, there's the Chapman filter on stat cast. Like, they don't have that anymore. But, like, mm-hmm. Skeens is, like, putting himself on that list of all the guys that throw a hundred. Um, and it's, it's pretty impressive. I, I don't, I'm not too sure about like what his control looks like. Uh, 21 to four strikeouts to walk is pretty good, but uh, yeah. I don't remember reading anything about his command. So I guess we'll wait and see, but impressive nonetheless worth the hype. And we get to see Livy Dunn every five days too. <laughs> yeah. You know, no, no arguments here, Steven. Yes, absolutely. Um, and, and going from, Pitching velocity to exit velocity. See how we did that, Steven? That's yes, called a transition. That's a good one. Um, you put it, and I'll let you preface it, but you put on the agenda, is exit velocity important? Question mark? Yeah, so Michael Wilbon from from um, from ESPN uh, made a statement uh, a while back, and he said that, uh, I just found the quote right here. So he's talking about, O'Neill Cruz's exit velocity. He said, <clears throat> quote, it angers me. He's a 260 hitter. So why do I care about the exit velo? I don't. And so I guess people need this to become interested and more fascinated and go, oh, wow. Uh, not only do I not go, oh, wow. It has started the ruination. Ruin- 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 what a weird ruination. Ruination of watching sports for me. Numbers like this put our screens, our Numbers like this put up on the screen repeatedly, day in, day out. Uh, so he was not a big fan for it, uh, for exit velocity. Ken Rosenthal said some stuff after that kind of took down what he said. And I was thinking about it because, like, why wh- is exit velocity really important? And I, I remember, like, growing up playing baseball, and, like, you probably went through the same thing, where the coach would just say, especially, like, you know, later in high school, it would always be hit the ball hard somewhere. And I, I always feel like there's over the course of a game, you could get robbed so many times by hitting the ball hard and not having anything to show for it. 
And like we have Babip, but I think a good idea of unlucky hitters could be exit velocity. And it is not an end all be all. That's what I want to say. Just because O'Neill Cruz is in the top percentile of exit velocity does not mean he's Babe Ruth. I just think it's like another tool to look at. Like I don't, I don't think it needs to be the whole equation like some people are making it seem. Yeah, I think Wilbon's kind of blown it out of proportion there. I think it, like you said, it's just another analytic. I mean, they they talk launch angle now too. I mean, at the ballpark, I think they show that after any ball put in play, right, is exit velocity and and launch angle. Uh, obviously, it's not the end-all be-all, but I mean, would you rather have a guy hitting the ball hard or not hitting the ball hard? And the answer is hitting the ball hard. Um, you know, you're not going out there saying, hey, just just tap it somewhere and and hope for the best. So, I mean, and I, and to be honest, I think it's fun for, it's probably more for fans than anybody, you know, it's cr crazy to look and say, wow, that guy hit that, you know, 112 miles per hour. That's ridiculous. Um, you know, so I think if someone's saying it's the end all be all, it's them trying to say it's an end all be all. And they're the ones putting too much into it than most baseball fans. Yeah. And, and nobody's putting a gun to anybody's head to where like you have to pay attention to exit below and sure it shows up on the screen during a course of a game but i like when a guy hits the ball hard and it's like wow that was a 106 off the bat um and, and i feel like i'm now familiar with what is considered a good you know exit velo and and all of that and and do i judge it do i judge it like do i judge players on it no like luis arias has like the lowest exit velocity out of any qualified hitter and he's constantly hovering around 350 with his batting average. He's good. Um, yeah. So, I mean. I do wish we had it around. I know we'll talk about him briefly near the end of the show, but I wish we had it around when, when Barry was playing. That oh, man. Been nuts. Yeah. Yeah, him and a bunch of the old timers who just hit. Ap McCovey, I think, is another one that, you know, who just rocketed the ball all over the place. And um, it would have nice to be to see exit velocity. And I get. Not everybody's going to buy into it, um, but hitting the ball hard is is a skill. Like it's a skill, and um, I don't think it's a bad bad thing that we're now finding ways to quantify it. So, um, mm -hmm. boomer takes all the way around. Get up with okay. the times. That's just my thought about that. Just real quick. Um, this is kind of a weird transition, but. There's another big injury that happened in baseball, and you know we we worst possible thing to happen is is obviously a a, a great player getting hurt, any player getting hurt, but somewhat of the capacity of Ronald Acuna Jr. is not fun to see, and a guy who's had um a uh, a surgery, an ACL surgery on his other knee, he's now getting another ACL surgery to repair a turn torn ACL, a uh, complete tear. Um, so he's going to be out for the entire year. It was a no contact play running the bases, just very, yeah. very sad for the regaining national league MVP and my MVP pick. Yeah. I mean, right when I saw the headline and it was Acuna injured on non-contact play, I was like, Ooh, yeah, that's probably not a good thing. Um, you know, it's a bummer. Like you said, he's already missed most of a season with a previous injury and now another one. So you know, it seems like every episode we're talking about some major star getting injured. Yeah. Uh, last episode, I think it was Trout, you know, and you kind of hope he doesn't become one of those what if guys, you know, what if he could have stayed healthy? Hopefully now they'll have two, you know, fresh ACLs. Hopefully he can stay healthy once he's back and return to form at least close to what he is. I don't know if anyone could return to the form he had last year, even if he didn't get hurt, but uh yeah, that's a it's a bummer, and and you could tell that he was kind of you know devastated by it. He's apologizing to fans on social media after it happened, like he could have done anything to control it. But um, you know, and those guys they're not just good; they're they're so fun to watch. I mean, that guy is a five tool player, and now you know what's interesting too, though, is the Braves are saying at least for now they're not looking to the trade market. They're going to try to f fulfill uh, the hole with from within and and roll with what they've got. So um, it'll be interesting to see how the, the Braves kind of uh, bounce back as a team from this too. Cause you know, they, they still have a very talented roster. We've talked about it. I mean, pretty much since this podcast has been in existence, the Braves lineup has remained the same and it's been yeah. dominant. And they've won without him. 
You know, they they yeah. won. They had to do this. They had to try and figure out a way to replace him when they won without him, and they did it. If I'm not mistaken, with Adam Duvall and Eddie Rosario and guys like that who came in and and filled in. And it's funny because as stacked as the Braves are, and as good as it's, of a season they're having, the Phillies are just on another level this season. And they've I think the Phillies have lost four straight at the time of this recording. Uh, but they hopefully, you know, hopefully five here in a few minutes. Yeah. In, in an hour or two. Yeah. About to possibly get swept by the Giants, but they're looting leading to nothing right now. But uh they're just on on fire this season and the Braves are back five games and um the East is gonna be between those two teams and this is a big injury for for the uh for the Braves. And uh look, I mean the Phillies have had big injuries with Harper in the past too, where he missed a lot of last season and um it's going to be interesting to see how how those two teams end up um, yeah. playing out their season. But I mean, I still think the Braves go deep in the play. I think they make the playoffs still. I think they could still potentially go deep, and it'd be pretty nuts if they go deep in the playoffs. Maybe even go to or win the World Series, considering that you know one of the preseason favorites for both Cy Young and and MVP are on their injured list right now. That's crazy to see. I, I forgot about Strider. Yeah, he's he's on there too. So probably two of their best players, if you really think about it. Two of their best players are are out for the rest of the year. They won't have them. Um, so that would that, cripple most teams, but they're still expected to be in the hunt. <laughs> yeah, and uh, we are definitely sad to see... Listen to this segue. We are definitely sad to see Ronald Acuna Jr. hit the shelf, but we are not sad to see... Angel Hernandez, hang up the cleats, hang up the mask, hang up everything. He is no longer going to be retired, or he's no longer going to be umpiring in Major League Baseball. He's calling his retirement effective immediately. We have seen the last of Angel Hernandez, Tyler. It was a Memorial Day miracle, Stephen. Yes. Um, you know, I, I'm not going to miss the guy. I don't think anyone really is. You know, I, I've heard reports, you know, that he's a, a nice guy off the field and people like him, but man, was he terrible at his job and it, and it wasn't even close. He's one of those, you know, welcome to the ump show guys, you know, I, especially on, on Monday when he announced it, there were reels of plenty of him blowing calls or making a, a show out of himself and making it seem like the game was about him. Um, you know, it, he sued major league baseball at one point saying he wasn't getting assignments or promotions because of his race. MLB came back and said, no, he's just garbage at his job and Major League Baseball won. So that should tell you all you need to know about the quality of umpire that uh, Angel Hernandez was. Yeah. And I think when he had that lawsuit, like MLB at the time had like multiple minority umpires, like umpiring the postseason. And they're just like, you're just not quite, you're not good. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, and and I know like the one thing is umpires back each other up, you know, that they, they always will. And Joe West said something about uh, how, you know, say what you want about Angel. He's good at his job. And look, I don't doubt that he's not a good guy. I'm sure he is. And, um, you know, none of it's pers none of it's personal, because, like, frankly, we don't know the umpires personally. The only one we kind of do know is Joe West. He's the only one that's kind of out there, but we don't know the umpires personally. So it's it's hard to judge his character. But just based on the way he does his job or did his job. Um, and, and here's another thing. This could be unpopular. I don't doubt that Angel Hernandez was was good overall. But, okay, hang on, hang on. I don't doubt that he, he like, you know, if someone wants to say that, that make the argument that he was, like, you know, probably a top 10 umpire, like, I'll buy it. But if you're an umpire and we know your name, and we we have this hatred towards you because you don't do your job and you're involved in every bad play, every bad call, then it is it it does overshadow the overall body of work. I don't know if that makes yeah. sense. Yeah, and, and it's not just like a fan base here or a fan base there. Like everybody Yes. Everybody was unhappy with this guy. I wanna one of my, the tweets I used to put out about him when he would blow a call was like, even Angel Hernandez's mom isn't an Angel Hernandez fan. <laughs> so, I mean, I'm, yeah, I mean, there's plays that come to mind of him that don't even include, you know, the Giants where I'm just like, man, what was he doing? That that one with Harper, was it last year or the year before? Um, yeah. Where he check tossed swing. him for the check swing that wasn't even close. Uh, I don't know if you, I sent it to you on Instagram, but did you see the Will Clark talking about Angel I Hernandez? I did, I did, yeah. <laughs> Basically, like, 
yeah, small strike zone or a wide strike zone on him. That night he saw him out for dinner. He bought him a round of beers. And the rest of his career, when Angel was behind the plate, he had like the tiniest strike zone ever. <laughs> yep. Yeah, that's a great story. But like, again, I don't doubt that he might be like good most of the time. But once it, it, it takes, you know, Jim Joyce had the one bad call that he's known for, right? The Galarraga perfect game. Every bad call seems like Angel Hernandez was involved. And it's like crazy I mean, yeah. to think. I think kind of what you're saying is once that's your reputation, anytime you blow a call, it there's a video of it. And yeah. people are saying, yeah. like, look at Angel Hernandez, where you know there's blown calls in every game and they're not getting called out on social media all the time because everyone has a mistake. Everyone messes up yeah. sometimes. But when you do it so consistently, he just did so it blatantly, more. it yeah. becomes your your persona, unfortunately yeah. for him. And it's funny because I do actually think a lot of the a lot of the people in baseball like don't really like I think Aaron Boone said something like there's worse umpires. And if anybody knows a thing or two about umpires, it's Aaron Boone because he's gotten tossed like more than By probably most of them. Yeah, he's like <laughs> doubled. He's like doubled the amount of ejections that like the next person has had since he's been hired. Um I think he's at like 20 something and like the next person's like at nine or something. It's like, what's going on? But, um, and, and Bob Melvin was like, yeah, Angel's a good guy. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's just some of the strike calls. I mean, I see all the, see all the compilations on Instagram and just, they're not just calls where it's like, oh, that's borderline could have gone either way. These are calls that you wouldn't even think would be considered strikes. Um, yeah. not even for a hot second. So um hanging him up angel hernandez um and apparently like mlb like suggested it and then he's like oh i agree but well i mean he didn't he didn't i don't think he umpired it all last year i think he had a back injury and then he hadn't umpired a game this year in like the last three weeks um and i i wonder if they were like look man like you're banged up you're a lightning rod when you're out there so why don't we just uh bid you adieu so yeah yeah Never know. Um, but it's a, it's an interesting thing. Angel Hernandez, like, I, I think a lot of people just like, I, I'm try, I, I'm not going to say what I was going to say, but I'll tell you off the air. But it, it, it's almost like one of those things, like, where, like, you know how the country comes together on certain things. And, like, <laughs> this is what it was. Like, so the, Angel Hernandez, like, unified baseball fans everywhere. No matter yes. what your beliefs about baseball are, you can uh, agree that Angel Hernandez was a terrible umpire. Yes. And, like, we had, like, both aisles probably just, like, high-fived each other. <laughs> but, the, <laughs> but um Dodgers fans and Giants fans hugging in the streets. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, they agree on something. Uh, so Angel Hernandez is retiring. Uh, and then the last thing we wanted to talk about before our ups and downs is the 2026 WBC. The host venues have been unveiled. Uh, do you want to mention what they are? Yeah, sure. We got a Lone Depot Park in Miami. I think that's where the final will be. I think they'll be hosting all three rounds. Uh, the Tokyo Dome, which I think has been involved in almost every World Baseball Classic. Uh, Hiram Bithorn Stadium, which is in Puerto Rico. Uh, I think I read that, that this is the first time Puerto Rico is hosting since 12 or 13. And then uh, first time host Minute Maid Park in Houston will be hosting some World Baseball Classic games. Awesome. So, yeah, I was just man. looking up. I saw Bryce Harper struck out or something, and he had an all-time temper tantrum breaking the bat in the dugout against the wall. Like, that was that's going to be clipped. You'll see it after, but it was an all time temper tantrum anyways. And they didn't toss him. Uh, no, I think I, oh, I it was I, in the dugout. It was in the dugout. He was slamming the bat up against the rack and stuff. Um, anyhow with the WBC. Yeah. It, I mean, these are all good options. I don't know. I don't know much about the international spots. I know the Tokyo dome is obviously iconic and, um, Lone Depot park was the last out, um, this year with the whole Otani trout matchup. Uh, Minute Maid Park. I don't think it's ever been there. So, uh, we've seen it in Chase Field in Arizona. Obviously, Arizona, you know, a a good, you know, spot to have it. Um, just in general, like country wise, in Arizona, it's yeah, always you got, you got out. all the you got all the you know half a baseball in spring training <laughs> yeah. close by climate controlled stadium. So, yeah, you know. yeah, exactly. And, you know, climate controlled stadium. Houston makes a lot of sense because they're in the middle of Florida and Arizona. So all the major league players, no matter what country they're playing for, they're going to have, you know, half 
half a continent flight instead of a full continent. Uh, and you know, climate controlled, they'll throw the roof on it if they have to. So it makes, yeah. it makes a lot of sense. Um, and, and in the past they've played it at Dodger stadium. They've played it at Petco. They've played it at Oracle. I went to one of the ones in I Oracle. wanted to come back to Oracle. I was hoping it would come back. Yeah. One day it will, I think. Um, one day it will, I think, but, uh, the Oracle one, who did I see play? It was Puerto Rico, I believe versus Dominican. Uh, but okay. then again, I feel like I saw the Netherlands play too. I'm not sure. I got to look back at the ticket. But um, all I remember a ticket. Is it, What's that? It wasn't on your phone at the time. You have a paper ticket. It was 2013. I do have the paper ticket. Damn, you're getting old, man. Man, that's 11 years ago, Tyler. So, <laughs> but uh, yeah, you know, and I know, you know, I enjoy the WBC. I know you're you really get into it. Uh, you know, maybe by the time 2026 rolls around, my little guy will be all into baseball and we can watch it together uh, and I'll get more into it. But uh, it's always just kind of cool just to see, you know, world baseball classic news because it means that it's coming up. I mean, it's a couple years away, but always good to have that to look forward to because it's it's really great baseball to watch. Absolutely. And and And, and speaking of watching, I'm watching Steven watch the Giants game. Uh, Okay. It looks like the bench is cleared. Um, so <laughs> it looks like the bench is cleared. Bryce Harper is in the middle of it. We've seen this before in San Francisco, and I know that this is not going to be timely to people, but the benches did clear. I missed what happened, but Kyle Harrison is involved. I don't know if he got mad at Kyle Harrison. That's definitely an interesting, uh, interesting thing to happen, but, um, Everybody's All this kinda... stuff always happens either while we record or Why right does... after we record. <laughs> so we are like, we can't really touch it. But hopefully now that you're a, a former college student, we'll be able to record yeah. more often. And exactly. we can. Uh... Matt Williams is in the middle of it. Um, he's he's pushing people aside, I guess. I don't know what just happened. Um, I, I wish somebody would tweet about it right now. But uh We'll figure it out. And uh, I think Bryce Harper got drilled by Kyle Harrison. That's my hypothesis. I missed. They're not showing a replay. So. Huh. Weird. And the yeah, umpires we'll to, are now getting together. So. Yeah. We might have to see what uh what's going on. Maybe while Ooh. we're doing the ups and downs. It was an up and in shot at Harper. It looked like it knocked the bat out of his hands. I don't know if he fouled it off the knob, but it was close to his head. So this could be a an, a live reaction of what happened, and then Harper took accept, uh, exception apparently, and that's surprising. That was that. So, anyways, back to original schedule programming. Sorry for that delay, but I don't know if the umpires are going to throw Harrison out of the game. That would be pretty pretty wild. But um, Harper's still at the plate. Anyways, let's get into some of the uh, the uh, ups and downs. I have the downs this week. I want to mention something about the call that happened in the White Sox Orioles game uh, just a few days ago. Um, There is a call where there is a pop-up on the infield. There's one out, a pop-up on the infield. And the runner at second was, um, I'm blanking on his name. He's the, he's Bay Area guy. I don't know why I'm blanking on his name, but the runner at second apparently interfered with Gunnar Henderson, the shortstop who came in trying to catch the ball, uh, ended up catching the ball, but there might've been like a little bit of contact and the runner at second was called out um, for interference. And it was an awful call. It ended the game. They called an infield fly roll. So the batter was already out and then they called interference. So the guy at second was out Uh, just an awful call. He was, he was walking back to the bag. It ended the game. There's no way you could end a game like that. Um, just kind of a weird, weird ending to the game and just a bad job by the umpires because there's no way. And MLB came out after and said that the wrong call was made. So yeah. anytime, and MLB has done that a few times this season. So it's like, what's going on? So just not a yeah, good call. I saw that play. It was a little hard to get a view of what happened because, you know, when a you know, there's not usually a, lot, a camera at the runner at second base when a ball goes up in the air. There's one shot where you can see it kind of in the corner, and he he turns. I think his bat. I don't even know if he ever saw Henderson. It's not like he was trying to interfere. Pop up, and he just turned to walk back to the bag, like you said. And I mean, the runner has to be able to go somewhere when a ball gets put in play. Um, like you said, mm-hmm. just terrible, t- terrible call. Uh, 
you know, if the White Sox don't make the playoffs, that game might be pointed at. <laughs> oh, God, they're so bad. They're so awful. But it's <laughs> funny that it's happening to them. Um, My number two down, I'm going to go with Francisco Lindor. And I'm going to go with Lindor for a few reasons. Number one, he's not playing well. And this is a guy that the Mets signed to a 10-year, $341 million deal. Uh, he signed through 2031. Um, and look, I think he fits New York very well. Um, he's, he's 30 years old. It's looking like he's heading into the second half of his career where it's just not going to be as great. Um, as of now, as of this season, he's hitting 210. He's got a nine, uh, a 651 OPS. Um, just not a lot of production there offensively, still a very good defensive player, but just not playing well for the Mets. And he's kind of been the the headliner or the the uh the poster child for the awful run that the that the Mets are having this season and they're 22 and 32 entering into this this day today. So not a great start for Lindor and one other thing that has happened, he took a pitch uh last week from Giants reliever Randy Rodriguez and it was a breaking ball right down the middle of the plate on a 3 and 2 count and he took it as if he was taking all the way and he struck out looking and it just didn't look like he was there to hit. And afterwards he said that he wasn't picking up the spin on the ball, kind of a weird situation. But, um, and then also when he went back to Cleveland, they asked him like, what do you miss most about Cleveland? And he said, winning just kind of a slight on his team. And I, I understand that that's good to be blunt. And I think the reporters and the media somewhat appreciate it. And I think the public does too, but <clears throat> Just a weird, not very good month for Francisco Lindor. So I would like to see him play better. And uh, some of the side stuff isn't fun either. Yeah, I mean, the saying like I miss winning doesn't bother me too much. I mean, players kind of say stuff like that to the media all the time, maybe not as bluntly. I mean, a few weeks ago, didn't Logan Webb say the Giants were playing like dog shit? So mm -hmm. <laughs> um, that's a good point. But yeah, I mean, he's just for a guy who's leading your team, uh, the, he's not playing like a leader of the team. And that's where I think, you know, Logan Webb, it, using him as the example, since I just brought him up, you know, he's at least been performing. <laughs> and so it's kind of hard to see, you know, one of the leaders of your team basically call out the team for not winning when he's not contributing in a way that would help the team win very much. Um, and he's not helping my fantasy team in my money league win either. So I'm, I'm all with you here on uh, Francisco Lindor being a down. So. Absolutely. And, and I guess staying from one former Cleveland guardian to another, uh, to a Jose, Ram Jose Ramirez, um, who, by the way, and I want to preface it by saying this, Jose Ramirez is like he's got a chance to be in that mold of being like a future hall of favor. Like he's, he's on path. He's 31 years old. He's got a lot of good numbers in his favor. If he plays another handful of years, he could be a hall of famer. He's on that. path. It's like sneaky, yeah. sneaky hall of famer. Um, <clears throat> now with that being said, he is not Barry Lamar bonds and he's doing some comparing himself. He's comparing himself to Barry Lamar bonds and he's saying that I'm better than Barry Bonds. Um, I forgot somebody asked him. I think they asked him in relation to like the run that he's been on. And there's a number that said uh, Jose Ramirez is the last person to do this since Barry Bonds. And he was like, well, I'm better than Barry Bonds. And he's having a good month, like Tyler we talked about off off uh, before this. But he's not Barry Bonds. And to compare yourself to a living, breathing legend like Bonds, is a little much. Sorry, he, Jose. And I love Jose he, Ramirez. I do. Yeah, I, I'm a fan of him. Uh, you know, I hadn't really, you know, looked at his career stats recently. I pulled him up, and you're right. You know, a few more solid years, he could definitely be in the conversation for Cooperstown. Um, I just laughed when I saw that quote. You know, at first I thought it was one of those, like, butt crack sports. <laughs> like, <laughs> you know, like fake quotes that they put out there, but no, it was legit. He said, I am better than Barry Bonds. Um, I mean, it, I'm all about, you know, players being confident in themselves. A lot of these guys have huge egos anyway, but got to show so, some restraint uh, in pumping yourself up. Otherwise you start losing a little credibility. And uh, I, 
I, I've never seen a baseball player with my own eyes better than Barry Bonds. I know uh, there's a few that have been uh, close, you know, that I haven't seen Willie, of course, and and Hank Aaron and those types, but coming out saying, and what's crazy is like everyone nowadays has seen Barry Bonds. <laughs> it's not like he's saying he's better than some guy and we can't go check the tape and compare. <laughs> yeah. It. You know, we, we have the, we have the footage of Barry hitting. And Ramirez is a great ball player. He's had a hell of a month. I think he's hit 11 this month, uh, 11 home runs. But let's be real here, Jose. Let's slow down, Jose. Let's slow down. And yeah. uh, just a little bit. We love you, but let's let's slow down. Yeah, what do we, we got for you, ups? Stop. Yeah, let's, let's finish on our high note. We'll go to the ups. Ah! There we go. I was waiting for it. Uh, I guess you weren't where you weren't. You weren't in choir at San Francisco State. No, I wonder if they had that. I would have joined. <laughs> um, first up, I'm going with uh, Padres reliever Jeremiah Estrada. He was a waiver claim, and he's struck out the last 13 hitters that he has faced. Get some. That is ridiculous. And counting. It's an active streak. It's a, ma- a major league record, at least <laughs> as far back as the um, expansion era. Uh, I don't know how anyone could have topped this even before that. Um, I went back and looked at like his last five outings. I was talking to Steven about this before we hopped on here. So in his last five outings, he's faced 21 hitters, gave up one hit. So 20 outs, 18 strikeouts in those 20 outs. I mean, that's That's absurd. That's absurd. Yeah. I mean, let me pull it up. I was, I mentioned it to you before, but on the season, his, uh, strikeouts per nine is 15.4. And his strikeouts per walk is seven. I mean, and nobody knows this guy. Nobody I mean, knows this guy. No, I mean, he's got good stuff. Because looking, I mean, he, he his ERA, previ- he was with the Cubs the last two years. Uh, You know, had a 6.75 last year. So I could see why he got DFA'd. But he's got the stuff. Uh, he he walked a ton of guys last year. Um, But his career strikeouts per nine is 13 and a half. So... Maybe it's clicking, and uh, and maybe the Padres are rolling into another monster arm for their bullpen. He's only twenty five. That's what I love so much about like sports is like if you're in Hollywood and you're an actor and you make a great movie and you never make another movie again, like you're not really remembered for much. Like you're 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 remembered for like your body of work. But in sports, I like how like you could have one feat. Even if like you play yeah. one year in the big leagues and you finish off with one year, in, you could have one feet and people will remember it. And like this is the type of thing that like gets someone on the map for like your immaculate grids of the world. You know, this is how yeah. it's this is how it happens. Yeah, um, I mean, if you get a Cubs Padre square, Jeremiah Estrada, Jeremiah Estrada. So I mean, th- this is how it happens. You know, it's kind of funny how how sports fans like one little thing to re- like Chris Heston threw a no hitter, like that yeah. we we remember him for that. Uh, Usmero Petit had that crazy consecutive outs. 46 consecutive outs. Like people remember when you do something like that. And uh, it, it's, I, I find it interesting because it's different than a lot of the way we view other stuff in our world. But really cool. I can't wait to see how long this streak lasts. No pressure. Yeah. Right. Keep it going, dude. Um, yeah. Uh, second, you know, this is partially because I'm, you know, we've talked about before. I'm a huge Cal Ripken fan, uh, today, actually Marcus Semyon's Ironman streak ends after 349 games. Uh, he actually wasn't the, the active leader. Uh, Matt Olson is at five ten, but 349, uh, it's basically two seasons. Uh, checked out his baseball reference. He's played all 162, I think three or four times. He's played at least 155, four other times. So it's a guy who doesn't like to take days off. Um, he has been struggling a bit. Uh, read uh, a quote from Boach saying he had an infield collision a few weeks ago that he's been kind of hobbled by since. So um, maybe uh, maybe a day of rest will will help him bounce back. But always kind of cool to see you know streaks like this and and kind of weird to see when they come to an end because you just expect to see those names in the lineup every day. Yeah, I give. I mean. I was taught, and I'm sure maybe you too, like the the most valuable asset, the most valuable ability is um, reliability and availability. 
And anytime you're able to put yourself in the lineup every single day and be available to your team, you are valuable and especially added on the production. You know, and Simeon's a guy yeah. who just mashes and he finished in the top in MVP last season, I think. And he played well in the postseason. Like, I mean, just a grinder and Olsen's doing a good job too. But the funny thing is, is we talk about Cal Ripken and he played in 2,632 straight games. Marcus Simeon is like 13, was 13% there. That's that. I mean, I could see why. Yeah, so I, I, yeah, I actually put it in. I, I was going to put it on the agenda so you could see it. And I was going to drop it on you here, but you were kind of beating going where I was going. So 2,632. That's Marcus Simeon would have to play 349 games, seven and a half times. And he would <laughs> still be just short. I mean, I mean, we talk about like unbreakable records. I think we have in the past on this podcast, like that one, I don't think is ever going to get broken. Yeah, no. Way. I mean that I, there's too much money involved with these players. There's too many things that, yeah. Um, and th- I think a big part of long. it is, yeah, I think a big part of it is the value of these contracts now. And if a guy's a little banged up, they're going to side on the air of caution and, and sit a star player. Yeah. Especially early in the season too. Like, yeah. you know, you could afford to give a guy a day off, um, you know, and you know, on May 29th, especially now where, um, where the season is, but yeah, I mean, I would like to see if anybody gets to a thousand straight. Um, I mean, for Olsen, maybe that's possible. Maybe that's something that he's looking for the next few years, but that's a lot of games. That's a lot of games. Yeah. And, um, we're going to have to, we're going to have, have I mean, it's to just see nuts to, it's nuts to think about, man, just like how talented you have to be as an athlete to play one major league game. Yeah, like ever, and these guys are playing hundreds and thousands in a row. It's just nuts to think about. Yep, and in the world of like the phantom IL, where like you know guys are going on the IL for like not a lot of reasoning. Obviously, you don't do that much with your best players, more so like the last guys on your roster. But yeah. so much transaction, so many trades, um, even the type of thing where like a guy's traded and like. I don't know if I don't know how this counts in, but remember when Chris Bryant was traded to the Giants and he didn't debut until like two days later? Like, does mm-hmm. that technically count of you know breaking your streak or whatever? I don't know, but yeah. um, yeah, it's a good question. But yeah, there's so but, much transaction yeah. in baseball that it's yeah. interesting that uh, I don't think it's ever going to get broken. Yeah. Uh, and then last but not least, I was I was going to put this as my top up, but I, I wanted to close with this. Uh, Officially, I think it was today, this morning, Major League Baseball has integrated uh, Negro League stats into the record books and basically merged it with Major League record books. Um, and so, uh, you know, Josh Bell, Satchel Paige, uh, even Willie Mays, Hank Aaron, Minnie Minoso, all those guys got a bump in their stats. Um, for, for some reason, they didn't include home runs. Uh, they They counted hits, but not home runs. I don't know if it's because the ballparks they played in or what i'm not sure what the reasoning was there but i mean josh gibson is now splattered all over major league record books he uh let's see he's now he has now the highest career batting average over ty cobb uh he he, he has a 372 career average uh cobb was at 367 he passed babe ruth for highest slugging percentage and highest ops um it's just cool to see i mean Obviously, I mean, we could do a whole podcast on the reasoning behind, you know, on why mm-hmm. this is a good thing. Um, but just to to recognize the quality of play that the Negro Leagues had just because they weren't allowed nothing against their nothing they did wrong. They weren't allowed to play Major League Baseball it doesn't mean that their accomplishments and their achievements on the field shouldn't be recognized. Yeah, it, it was a major league. It really was a major league. And it's interesting. The home runs is interesting because like there's tall there's tall tales where it's like Josh Gibson hit eight hundred something homers. And um mm-hmm. I am fascinated. I think I, I told this to someone yesterday, but like I'm very fascinated about like how like the work that goes in to trying to count up these box scores, to try and like do research and find stuff that's been like not found for years. Like I don't know if you've ever heard about the way like before computers, how a lot of that baseball almanacs were come up with, like people would go and hand count the numbers from the box score and just add it all up like that. Every single yeah. year they would do that. 
Um, so I'm like thinking about like all the research that people do or that people have done to make this happen. And it's a lot like the Negro leagues, I believe has some roots in the 1920s and in a league that didn't have like the resources that major league baseball had, like it's probably tough to find a lot of those numbers. So yeah. that's all I kept thinking about. Like, damn, how, like, how do we even know how many starts Satchel Page had in a year? Like it could be unlimited amount and. Maybe there's only a few on like few not on record that we'd have to count. It's difficult, difficult process. So I give a lot of credit to the people that that made that happen. And it is a cool thing. And uh, a lot of people that that came out with like baseball trivia are going to have to update their stuff. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Like a lot of those like playing cards with the trivia, like they got to get back to the drawing board. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, you know, we, we, you made kind of an old man yelling at clouds reference earlier, or get off my lawn. I forget which one it was. And seeing a few of those guys or those people in the comments on some of these tweets about it, but, uh, that's, it says more about them than anyone else. Exactly. That's all I'll say on that. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, I mean, you know, yeah. When, when you have, when you have like a gen and, and like, Granted, is is this the most perfect way to honor the Negro Leagues? No, but it's recognition, and recognition is everything. And, um, you know, the, the it was disappointing, like how everything went down, how everything ended. Like those teams did not get compensated for when the players went to the major leagues, and that's what destroyed the league. Um, yeah. you know, the now we see posting systems internationally, and that's helping out the international teams, and, um integration was like a very messy process and it's kind of interesting and it destroyed destroyed the negro leagues it really did but um yeah it's a it's a cool thing though i'm glad that they glad that they did this and people could keep yelling yeah absolutely so i think did did we do it steven did we shut it down we shut it down like we did you we say that you again. shut it down on the stage when you got your diploma like you said you would no i don't I think forgot. you did i forgot Missed uh, opportunity. It's funny. The one at the ballpark, they just gave like a, um, they, it, it looked like a diploma, but like, since they're not going to give out thousands of diplomas and organize them like that. Yeah. It's like the um, empty folio. It's, it's got like a letter from like the president of the school saying that you did it. And then at the journalism one, they gave out like a little badge type thing. And then probably in a few months, I'll get the diploma in the mail. And I have a diploma holder that I got part of the package with the gown and uh i don't know if you ever go into like classrooms or whatever where teachers have it hanging up like if i ever have an office like that's going in there my bad i used to have there. mine up in my office and then our friend jordan elliott gave me a bruce bochy signed photo and i was like i'll enjoy looking at this more than my diploma so that's where but i still have mine for sure what is your major what, what did you major in uh business administration mm, very nice yeah but so. you you i i mean i consider you a very very much an academic tyler oh thank you sir yeah i read i read many books that have a lot of pictures in them so yeah <laughs> <laughs> uh well no this is good uh and again we could probably do this more regularly now there's a lot less that i have to um giants i have phillies are just hitting the ball all over the place um but yeah we could probably do this more regularly now that i uh my schedules are are a lot are lifted pretty much. So yeah. shut it down again. And thank you everybody for listening. You can follow us uh, on Twitter at shutdown underscore inning. Go check us out. Uh, go subscribe wherever you listen and see you next time. That's what's up. Out of bed.